In this segment, <clears throat> I want to deal with the topic that's very close to my heart, and that is, why does God uh, allow evil and suffering? Or to put it another way, why does an all-powerful and loving God allow evil and suffering? You know, certainly one of the most common and painful objections that people ask is this. Why does God permit evil and suffering? It's a painful question because it deals with pain. And it's a deeply existential issue. I mean, just from the gut. And it's one that really has preoccupied my heart for nearly all of my life. Um, everyone reading or hearing this has dealt with this issue to some extent, and some of you on a very profound level. Speaking personally, this question has haunted me since I was 16 years old. Prior to that, I was just bopping along through life, and then when my older brother Jack died in an accident, I uh, was very reluctantly ushered through a door, kicking and screaming that I did not want to, to go through. It was a dark door, and it changed my life forever. And since then, I've, um, yeah, life's not been, been the same. And uh, after, the, after that, I've also experienced the premature deaths of three other siblings, um, as well as my mom and dad. So I'm, I'm uh, quite familiar with uh, pain and uh, suffering. And so this has been an issue that I've uh, dealt with personally since I was... Uh, 16 years old. So, to put it in a logical form, it goes like this. Premise number one. If God is omnipotent, all-powerful, he is able to prevent evil. Number two. If God is good, he would want to prevent evil. Three. But evil exists. Four. The conclusion, then... I, either God is not omnipotent, or he's not good, or he doesn't exist. So how, how do we deal with this? <clears throat> well, some have tried to answer this objection or dilemma, excuse me, <clears throat> by watering down one of the horns of the dilemma, um, one of God's attributes, um, watering down either his omnipotence or his goodness. And you may recall a while back that Rabbi Kushner wrote a book that was uh, quite popular. I think it's Why Bad Things Happen to Good People, something like that. It was, um, and his, his answer to the problem of suffering and evil was that basically God is not all-powerful. Um, but for a Christian, this, that's not an acceptable option. And to be honest, it's not a satisfying answer either. Um, not, not really, not to me. So that's stating the problem of e evil in a, in a logical fashion, but it's also deeply emotional as well. And um, in addition, there is a distinction between natural evil and moral evil. So stated simply, why is there so much evil and suffering in the world? How do we as Christians answer that? And um, it that can be addressed from multiple angles and in different ways. And many people have tackled this issue. Uh, there have been a ton of books that have been written on this subject, both from a skeptical, skeptical vantage point as well as from a believer's perspective. So these are my reflections today. It might be different tomorrow. Not essentially different, but um, some other religions would offer radically different answers 
to the problem of evil. For example, in historically pantheistic countries, that question is rarely even asked. It's it's not even it's not even raised. Um, why? Because karma is assumed. So um, it's interesting how profoundly worldviews um, play out in real life, isn't it? Then you have Islamic countries, and uh, the reply would normally be, normally be something like, in the face of, of tragedy or evil or suffering, it is God, uh, Allah's will. It's really, from my experience, it's only in countries that have been influenced by the gospel uh, or are borrowing from the capital of our Christian heritage <clears throat> that raise this question, which points to the need to keep God in the paradigm to answer the question, and I'll explain that more in a moment. Um, some other non-Christian options are, if you think of some Hindus and Christian science, they deny that suffering exists altogether. It's merely an illusion. But if you were to press them, they would have to recognize that the illusion of evil is itself evil. You follow me? That the illusion of evil would itself have to be evil, thus refuting itself. If, if, uh, if the illusion of evil is evil, then that means there's evil. Plus, it fails the existential test. I remember when I first was in college and I first heard of the notion of uh, evil and suffering being an illusion. First thought in my mind was, that's stupid. Just kick the person in the shin and then um, see how they would respond then. And, and uh, they would see how... Uh, non-true life it was, but that's, that's strongly inadvisable unless you uh, want to go to jail. So, <clears throat> how would you answer this question if a person asked you why this happens? Well, um, in a very real sense, it depends upon where they're coming from. If a person is a Christian, then I would take them directly to Genesis 3, but, um, and we'll get there in, in, a, in a shortly, but let's be hypothetical and pretend <clears throat> that a skeptic, or uh, I'm going to call his uh, agnostic, my agnostic friend Joe, and Joe has come to me and he says sharply, if God is so good and powerful, why does he allow all this evil and suffering? Let me break that from that for a second and say that it was C.S. Lewis and Francis Schaeffer who taught me that I need to pay close attention to the assumptions that are expressed in people's questions. And it was particularly Francis Schaeffer who was a master at listening to people talk in conversation and compa compassionately taking the roof off their heads and exposing them to heavy weather. And what I mean by that, exposing them to heavy weather, is that he would show them the logical conclusion to their non-Christian presuppositions and help them to see the, the horror that it would lead to if they live consistently, which nobody does, Nobody can live consistently with a non-Christian presupposition. But we live in a weird time, y'all. Uh, Postmodernism in our truth-denying age. Um, I really believe that we need to recover um, a presuppositional apologetic because folks often don't care about evidence. 
they assume that truth is irrational. You know, our grandparents, our parents, and we, when we are growing up, we were swayed by evidence. If we wanted to, um, if we were looking at, you know, Christianity or other religions, we would look to see the evidence, you know, things like, um, you know, miracles and, and uh, prophecy and, and uh, evidence for uh, the resurrection and so forth. Um, that, had, that had an impact on us. But many, we have to, re, we have to uh, grasp this, y'all. Many young folks, perhaps most young folks today, don't care if we have tons of evidence. They just, they don't care. Because their conception of truth is, my truth is what works for me, not your evidences. You follow me? If their understanding of how you come to truth is not by what is uh, true, you know, where the evidence leads, but what works for them, then evidence is, in addition, you throw into the mix the, the fact that, that uh, most young folks believe that truth is irrational. Um, it's not it's not an either war you know we need to rely on the holy spirit and prayer to see whether or not it's a presuppositional route or an evidential or a combination of the two but we do need to wake up to this new reality and and, and not pretend that it's even 20 years ago um, when evidence has had more of an impact on people it's an act of compassion, like I was saying, that Schaefer was so uh, gifted at, is that we need to help people to see the horror of darkness that their presupposition leads to. Because what this does, it gets them out of the smug, smug complacency that they're in, or just simply out of the comfort zone of unbelief by you know, the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay, let me get back to my uh, skeptical agnostic friend, Joe. And he says, he's asking me, uh, Mark, um, if God is so good and so all-powerful, why is there evil in this world? And so I reply, well, why do you ask, Joe? And I try to ask it tenderly. And he, if he replies that his mother just died and he starts weeping, then the conversation, conversation stops. And I weep with the man. And I hug him. Then, when the time is right, and Joe says, I'm ready to talk now, um... And he says, that's why I can't believe in God, because mom died. One of the reasons. Okay, so where do we go from there, y'all? All right, this is, again, a hypothetical conversation between Joe and myself. Um, Joe, would you agree that evil assumes that there is good as well? That is, if evil exists, that that implies that good exists as well. And then Joe replies, uh, yeah, that, that makes sense. All right, Joe. Would you then also agree that there has to be a law, some moral code, in order to differentiate between good and evil? That is, to give content to good and evil. Otherwise, there's no foundation for right and wrong, for good and evil. And after some going back and forth, Joe agrees, says, yeah, yeah, okay, I, I, I agree to that. Okay. Now, Joe, if there is a moral law, then there has to be a moral lawgiver. 
It doesn't just drop out of the sky. So, which is precisely what you're agnostic about, right? So let me elaborate. In order for there to be evil, there has to be good. And for there to be evil and good, there must be a law to differentiate between the two. And if there is a law, then there must be a moral lawgiver, right? Okay, just I'm following you, keep going. All right, well, and further, Joe, we're talking about persons who are suffering evil, right? Not rocks, not sticks, persons, people have to have dignity in order for evil to be something that they should not experience. In your naturalistic system, Joe, of cause and effect, in which we are nothing but the blind product of time and chance, then there is no foundation for either morality or human dignity. We are naked apes, cosmic accidents. Now, I'm not saying, Joe, that you're immoral. Uh, I know you're a moral man. But what I am saying is that you do not have a sufficient foundation for either more morality or human dignity. In your system, morals are nothing but preference. And humans are personal warts, personal warts on the face of an in personal universe with no final reference point for morals, meaning, or purpose. And that's terrifying, Joe, because with no reference point, we have no basis for understanding any kind of um, meaning. In a sense, we are less than the grass because there is no ultimate fulfillment for our personal aspirations. At least the grass being impersonal fits in with what is ultimate reality, and that's impersonal. But being personal beings in an impersonal universe is like water rising above its source. We're out of place. Um, so the what I'm getting at, Joe, is that the last piece is establishing that persons are actually worth protecting from evil. We saw that we needed to have a lawgiver. Now we need to see that persons are actually worth protecting from evil. Because if we are less than zeros, then why not inflict suffering and evil on people? In other words, my dear friend, we have to keep God in the paradigm in answering the question of human evil, or becomes ultimately incoherent. All right, let me stop the hypothetical now. Are you following me here, my friends, that when we're talking with, say, a skeptic, um, we have to keep um, God in the paradigm or the concepts of evil and personhood don't have any foundation. And um, so it's, it's vitally important that um, there's no way of answering this question. I know, is, I know it's an objection, but without God, there's no question there, there's no evil to, um, there is no evil, and there is no per, real persons to experience evil. We're just cosmic accidents experiencing what's happening in this world. If we are nothing but the random products of a cause and effect system, um, and a, uh, just chance universe, then there's no, there is no coherence. There is no, there's no coherent answer to that question. So, um, without God, we lose the concept of both evil and humanness. And I realize I haven't answered Joe's question yet, but I had to deal with his presuppositions first. So hopefully uh, that makes sense. So, um, 
You know, I heard the, recently that one man was converted just by looking at a flower because he said to himself, you know, there's such beauty in that flower. And if there's truth, then it must explain two things. It must explain why the world is simultaneously so beautiful, like this flower, and so ugly. See, this man had just, he had gone through the 20th century, the World War II. The 20th century, with all its heady talk of optimistic uh, humanism, was the bloodiest of all centuries. And this man was cured of his optimistic humanism, and he was afraid of falling into a dark abyss of nihilism. And he discovered that Christianity alone could explain both realities. And what I mean by both realities is the beauty of nature and the ugliness of that side of nature, as well as both sides of humanity, the beautiful side, the noble side of, of human beings, as well as the, the selfishness and as well as the deep inhumanity to man that um, we're capable of and was expressed with such horror um, in the Nazi uh, death camps. So going from there, and this is where I would start if someone was a Christian, is <clears throat> um, how, how do we explain human suffering with God being so, um, so powerful and, and so good? is that God tells us that he originally made creation very good. Genesis 1.31, there was no evil, there was no death, just beauty. But he gave Adam and Eve one command, and when they disobeyed, it had cosmic consequences. In a word, the world we live in now, with all its pain, all its suffering, death, and evil, is abnormal, and that's very, very important. Albert Camus wrote a book called The Plague, and it outlined the dilemma of this whole issue of fighting against evil in a world in which um, if evil is normal, which he was assuming in his novel, then the priests would be fighting against God, but he had a false assumption, and that is that the world is, as we know it now, is not normal. Death is abnormal, and only the Christian system can adequately explain both the beauty and the beast in humans and in nature. Um, Natural evils such as tsunamis, tornadoes, and hurricanes are the result of the moral fall of Adam in uh, space and time. But if the fall had cosmic consequences, so does the redemption have cosmic consequences and um, its scope of redemption is cosmic as well, which is something that we need to uh, keep in mind and <clears throat> God did <clears throat> God didn't just die <clears throat> excuse me for us as individuals but he died Christ died so that um, the whole universe would be um, restored to its pristine beauty Something else along these lines, as you remember the story of Lazarus and how Jesus raised him from the dead. Well, the Bible says that Jesus had two, this is from uh, John 11, Jesus <clears throat> had two emotional responses. You know, the shortest verse in the Bible, he wept. <clears throat> well, he not only wept, but in the Greek, 
he was furious. And both of these emotional responses are profound for our discussion. When Jesus saw the death of his dear friend Lazarus, <clears throat> to me it seemed to have epitomized <clears throat> just how far this world had fallen from his original design. And it profoundly saddened him, but it also deeply angered him. Obviously not at Lazarus, it angered him that a world that he had made and designed for us to be so beautiful had become so corrupt and so full of pain, suffering, ugliness, and so on. So the anger is towards the ugliness of the fallen condition of his world, which he had originally created good. And this is a titanic, a massive answer for skeptics like my friend Joe, and for us as well. You know, in, in fact, <clears throat> without the historical fall of Adam and Eve in space and time, I do not think that I could be a Christian, speaking for myself. <clears throat> That's how significant this issue of evil, pain, and suffering is. Um, it's, a, it's an amazing, satisfying, sufficient answer for explaining how God can be all-powerful, all-good, and the why, why the world is as it is. Now, it doesn't go behind it as to, you know, God knowing in advance. That's a distinct issue, <clears throat> which I don't really have time to go into. But what it does explain is the reality that we live with moment by moment, and that is living in the shadow of the fall. Um, and, you know, what I would say to my friend Joe is that, you know, I'm, I'm human like you are, my friend. I live in, we, we live in the same world as the skeptics who come to us and who are complaining. We have to live in this, this, um, pain-wracked world as well. And we, we experience deep loss, evil, and death as well. And if this world is normal, if it is normal, the way that God had made it, if there is a continuity between God's original creation and the world that we experience it now, like I said, I couldn't be a Christian. But an am amazing thing is that there is creation and then there is a massive discontinuity between the original creation and the world that we live in now, and that is the fall. So the whole drama of redemption, the bookends of it, can be expressed this way. You have creation, you have the fall, you have the cross, and then you have the second coming of Christ. That's the drama of redemption in the bookends of human history and cosmic history as well. So, um, what you know? What about this? Um, the way it's normally put about God being all powerful and good. Um, couldn't God have stopped them? Uh, I'm not sure of all this, um, but a big part of being human is the ability to love and to make responsible choices, right? And if I'm determined by an outside source, be it God or someone else, then I might be compelled to do something, but true love cannot be compelled. Um, that would be maybe compliance or whatever. But true love can only be something that can be freely chosen. Um, I want to I address this issue, though. 
again, usually the horns of the dilemma are God's omnipotence and his goodness. But why, why stop there? Because the word of God states that the Lord has many attributes. Um, and I discussed them in this series on systematic theology. Things like God being eternal, uh, his holiness, his justice, uh, the fact that he's omniscient or knows all things, and uh, so on. So the dilemma, his power and goodness, could easily become a ten, pen, pen dilemma, five, or even a death dilemma, <laughs> ten uh, attributes of God. My point is that once we see that the world has fallen and abnormal, and that God himself weeps, then we can also see how God, perhaps God can bring good out of evil. It's the most evil event in history, the most obscene act in human history, was the crucifixion of the only innocent human being who ever lived, the only perfect human being, um, the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus. The most evil event in human history brought about the greatest good, our salvation, and it showed the Father's love. It showed the, the, the Trinity's love. I may not. In fact, I know I can't answer all of people's or my own questions about this issue of suffering. But I know, I know this, y'all. I know that God is loving because of what he has shown through Jesus. And he has shown us the Father. And the agony that Christ experienced in the garden and the agony that he experienced on the cross is the greatest expression of his love. Um, let me share a story <clears throat> that I heard recently from Ravi uh, Zacharias. It goes like this. One day a man lost his horse and his friend came and said, Ah, what bad, bad luck losing your horse. And the man replied, What do I know about, about luck? And then the next day, the horse returns with 20 wild horses with it. The neighbor says, What good luck you have getting all these horses. And the man replies, What do I know about luck? few days later, his son is kicked by one of the horses, and it breaks his leg. And the neighbor comes by and says, What bad luck your son's had, breaking his leg? And the man replies, What do I know about luck? And soon after, a gang of thugs come looking for recruits, and they wanted to forcibly get the boy to join them. But once they saw that he had a broken leg, they left him, and they went to the next house. And the neighbor said to him, What good luck that your son had a broken leg. And the man said, <laughs> You see my point. The point is, is that what do we know? What do we know? Uh, the older I get, the less I know about everything. But I know God's not everything. I know and am convinced more and more of God's love and of his wisdom and his wise ways. But on another level, what do I know? Yeah, I know very little of his, the immensity of the distance between God's knowledge 
in my own puny little understanding. We know there is no luck in God or in his world. We have to realize that some things we are going just to have to wait until heaven to understand. God is all wise, he's all knowing, he's all loving, and he is sovereignly weaving all things together for our ultimate good. It may not appear good now. Indeed, some things that happen to us will in fact be real evil, evil actions of evil men. But God is so big, so sovereign, he can and he will override their actions for our good. They can be, as C.S. Lewis called them, severe mercies. And I think you would probably agree that most of our growth has come through our pain. I saw a guy in the gym today with a t-shirt that read, and it said, on it, pain is weakness leaving the body. I know this. That if you were to ask 10 people, 10 Christians, how they were converted, and if their testimony, if it included some painful trial, if that played a significant factor, I think most of them would say yes. It certainly was the case for me because the death of my brother that I mentioned at the outset was in fact what eventually a year later brought me to my knees before Jesus. Pain, as Lewis again said, is God's megaphone to a deaf world. So I pray that God may use the trials in our lives to help us to grow in our Christ-likeness or like the prodigal son to bring our lost loved ones to their senses. There's not a day that goes by that I do not feel the weight of the pain of living in the shadow of the fall. We're all schizes to an extent, schizoids, all of us, we're all, we all have broken places inside, all of us. We all live every moment of our lives in the shadow of the fall, but Jesus can and does redeem our suffering. You know, really the most painful of all is loved ones dying outside of Christ. We're concerned that that will happen. So some questions are ultimately unanswerable and we have to move on in faith. But in closing, remember that the fall is the entry point in space and time of evil and suffering into this lovely world. And it's our fault. God knew in advance, of course he did, but he freely chose to make this world anyway. So may God use us to bring comfort to those suffering with the comfort we ourselves have received from our Lord. Amen.